You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is August 19, 2019, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, ocular allergy. Our presenter is Dr. Leonard Billery. He's a professor of medicine at the Rutgers University Center for Environmental Prediction in Springfield, New Jersey. Ophthalmology is a, is a um, you know, now almost a bastard child in medical school where it's almost an elective um, to perform, and it, it's a choice uh, if you're in a career, surgical, or along that. When I was in medical school, maybe when Paul, well, we were required to do, you know, between one to two to four weeks of it because it was a surgical specialty um, uh, of knowledge in that. So as such, the in the allergy office, it's kind of very important that we do go over the ocular surface problems because it, you know, it's rhinoconjunctivitis, and sometimes perhaps the term is really conjunctival rhinitis, where the ocular surface is really a primary complaint of many patients, and it, it certainly is equivalent in the intensity and severity. Uh, in, in studies that actually was published by Dr. Blaze and myself, um, I wrote the ocular component, uh, Blaze wrote the overall, what's a, which was a allergies across America, and then there was an ENT, and we found the intensity of, you know, nasal congestion was really up there, but right behind it, and almost equivalent, is ocular surface disease involvement of the eye. And as such, it's really an important feature of how do you address it, you know, what's the differential diagnosis, and how to manage it. So that is basically, this is the, the primer for the, for, the ophthalmo- for the allergist and ophthalmology. And I have to disclose, i uh, taking fees and from which companies, and that's what, you know, for regards of CME, and provide an overview of the objectives to appreciate the uh, differential diagnosis, which is on slide three, to recognize the various clinical signs and symptoms and to learn the various treatment modalities. As we move into slide four, uh, in this regards, there is an overlap. Uh, when we talk about conjunctivitis, we can talk about the... Uh, inflammatory response, the, whether rubor, calor, dolor, tumor, and the, the quote-unquote functulacea of, of, the, of the condition, the calor, um, meaning the inflammation that occurs there. Uh, it could be from allergic response uh, in general, which everybody, a mixed response from perennial mixed with a seasonal allergy component. Perennial is really less, and is usually less in the number of it. Um, number of individuals, but also less in intensity. Uh, the, if you get seasonal, those are the ones who get conjunctival uh, injection, that swelling of the periocular. You usually don't get that from perennial unless you touch the cat and the cat allergen and you bring it right to your eye. So it's a, these are the overview of what's going on. When you look at allergic rhinitis and it, as a national condition, this was a publication um, that was very it was quite fascinating in that regard. In this regard, that uh, quote unquote, if you look at the numbers of patients, prevalence of patients with allergic rhinoconjunctivitis, of more than seven days, then the, the numerator is nasal, the oc- the denominator is ocular. Across the realm of the regions across the country, when this is done of a in a national condition study ocular conditions were seen to be more uh, than 70s and were always in, heavily involved. And th- this gives you a percentage that, oh, there was a signal that, you know, look, it's, why are we calling it allergic rhinitis when we, the ocular con- condition was there more persistently? And if you look at the Isaac, Isaac prevalence study for itchy eyes in 13 or 14 years old, it's, it's up there. And, you know, it depends where. I mean, I've been in Beijing, uh, even though it says 7.9. Um, quite honestly, I mean, they wear masks, but uh, their ocular conditions were quite involved in a lot of what we'll call tear film abnormalities. So get a perspective. This is a background that ocular component is heavily involved in the nasal component in patients who have complaints of what we call allergic rhinitis because it really is allergic rhinoconjunctivitis. So let's go through what are the various causes of what I will say is the red eye, because it's not, you know, it's good to know, you know, easily 
how to treat allergic conjunctivitis. It's a super, it's a, uh, uh, an anterior surface condition. It's a histamine-induced itch or tearing, uh, which you're, the experts or the allergists of how to modulate that. But you need to know the differential. Uh, meaning what's, what, what makes this different, or the patient comes with persistent, acute or chronic, what makes it different from other ocular conditions that could be site-threatening or, quote-unquote, not allergic in nature? One of them is discharge. Obviously, if I have an infection far to the right, and this is on slide number seven, it's going to be watery or purulent, even watery, meaning if it's viral, you usually get very watery discharge. You don't get a neutrophilic in infiltrate, and even if you do get lymphocytic, it's in the actually the conjunctiva and does not spill over into the tear fluid itself. The purulence is obviously the glue eye. If it's glued eyed shut, if a person wakes up with a ropey discharge that glues their eyes shut, think infection. And so in that regards, do you get a discharge when you have corneal trauma? The only one you get is tear, excessive tearing because your eyes are blinking constantly. Acute uveitis, which is an inflammation inside the eye, is not associated with an anterior surface response. So if someone has inflammatory conditions, and, they, and we'll go over what's go, uh, what the symptoms would be, uh, but that's inside the eye. Anterior surface is not usually seen. Similar to what in column three would be acute glaucoma is pressure inside the eye and therefore you rarely get any discharge on the outside whereas cornea, an abrasion, you will get blinking and sometimes excessive tearing. Whereas in acute conjunctivitis there is constant and persistent uh, moderate to copious discharge. In conjunctivitis, the only time you, you really get a blurriness of vision is when there's so much tearing that there is a, there's a diffraction effect from the excessive fluid on the anterior surface. Acute uveitis, you actually get photophobia, which is some discomfort, and as the next line will say, pain, which will lead to blurriness of vision. And the blurriness of vision in acute uveitis is due to flare of protein, and cells floating inside the eye, blocking the normal visual axis. The corneal trauma gets markedly blurred, and infection usually blurred. Pain. Now, this is a differential diagnosis that every allergist needs to know because there's been lawsuits that allergists have lost because they missed that statement, or they had the statement in the record, but they missed the diagnosis. Pain, in quote, is not usually associated with allergic conjunctivitis. You know, you have discomfort, fine, but pain, that's an unusual statement. In acute intraocular inflammation, you can have pain. Photophobia is light sensitivity to the point of being pain. In corneal trauma, when you scratch somebody's cornea, we all know we've uh, had some experience in the ER rotations, whatever, um, that that caused severe blepharospasm and pain that the eyelid, you just can't open your eye. It's so painful. Infection can also lead to pain because you can lead to actual, uh, you know, conjunctival involvement. And, and it's not just a conjunctival, but the corneal involvement. Well, and the word cornea, you're going to learn the term, is kerato. You know, keratoconus is a coning of the cornea. So the kerato is involved. So we call keratoconjunctivitis. When you have kerato, it means the cornea is involved. When you have injection, well, in allergic conjunctivitis and acute, it is diffuse. And, you know, and as you move toward the fornices, what's a fornix? The fornix is the corner, is the corner of the eye, where the eyelid internally meets the eyeball. That's a you know, cul-de-sac there. That's called a fornix. So as the, it's a diffuse and it increases as you go to the fornix. Why? It's because that's where gravity c gathers all the mediators and the concentration of histamine and other mediators are increased and therefore your redness increases as you move away from the cornea. In acute uveitis, the cornea is clear. Um, as, whereas in the inflammation, this is a very important conjunctival injection, there is something called the what we call the ciliary flush, um, and that's because underneath the corneal scleral junction, 
where the conjunctiva meets literally the cornea, the clear cornea meets the, the kind of the white of the eye. Right underneath there is the ciliary body, which produces the fluid, the aqueous humor. If you have a in glaucoma, if you have blockage of that canal of Schlem, if people remember, that's where the ciliary body is. It produces it and it drains right there. And if you have any inflammation of uveitis in there, or from pre you will get a red line. And I think I have a picture of that just to give you um, a concept. And if not, then I'm going to ask, ask Paul to point it out where you normally see it when we get to the photo. Again, infection, is, it can be very localized, can be very intense. The cornea is clear in acute conjunctivitis. It's clear in a uveitis. No, there's no involvement of the cornea in, in intraocular inflammation. Interestingly, in corneal trauma, obviously the cornea is involved, or glaucoma, the cornea gets very steamy, it gets hazy. And in infection, it can be, the clarity decreases due to the actually involvement of the cornea. Pupil size, normal. Normal, normal, normal in acute conjunctivitis. No pain, normal pupil. Acute uveitis, moderate pain, and the pupil shrinks to decrease the light entry because of photophobia. In glaucoma, it's widened. There's a pressure that forces it to be open. And in, infect and in routine infection, it's normal. Pupillary light response, normal for acute poor because as a response to the light coming in, it really, there is minimal effect. Uh, intraocular pressure. Now, obviously, glaucoma is the only one that's elevated. Now, how would you test that by physical exam if you suspect intraocular pressure increase? Touch the eyeball through the eyelid. It should be spongy. If you, everybody, take your finger and touch your eyeball through the eyelid, you can push on it, and you can feel there's a give. Everybody feel that? Yep. OK. If you have glaucoma, it feels like a golf ball. No give. It will, you will feel the difference. And uh, it's just very simple. Now, again, we'll talk about you know the pupillary. If you take a light and shine it from the side, the the diaphragm, the iris, um, literally, will be pushed forward and will cause a shadow. That's another clinical way to, to look for some pressure, intraocular pressure, forcing the iris to bulge forward and therefore give a shadow. But if you shine a light in, in your next temptation, you'll see there is no shadow. And obviously, if you do a smear, you will find organisms in the corneal ulcers of infection, um, you know, in that regard. And whether it's, that's a computer viral or something like that, you may see something there as well. Next slide, which is um, slide number eight. The overlap. Well, IgE is seen a lot in the seasonal, as you all know. It's seen in a Th2 type conditions, which are AKCs and VKCs, and we'll mention a little bit more toward the end, which is atopic keratoconeal, kerato keratoconjunctivitis, or vernal, which means spring-like. It really hits in the spring. TH1, meaning it's not an allergic response, is TFD. TFD means tear function de deficiency, tear film deficiency, otherwise known as dry eye syndrome, but it's not really dry eye. In this condition, people will ex have excessive tearing. Why? Because the tear film is made of three components. It's made of oil that floats on the tear. It's made of fluid water in the middle. It's sandwiched on mucin which makes it stick to the eyeball. If I have no oil made by meibomian by glands or poorly produced, I will have excessive tearing because the, there's nothing to hold. That there's no cap on the lid, so to speak, and fluid tear it just pours off. If I have no mucin, I will have, quote unquote, uh, no way for the water, the fluid, the tear to stick to the eyeball. It will cause uh, it to fall off. If I have no water, that's keratoconjunctivitis sicca. Now, what do I mean by excessive tearing? How many of you ski? All of you? Have everybody skied? Yes. Skied off snow skiing. Well, if you don't wear goggles, what happens to your eyes? You tear. 
you get tears. You get excessive tears. Why? The, it evaporates fast, and you have a response. Its reflective response is to produce more tears. So when you have tears coming off, just like a ski, uh, you know, skiing, you will reflectively produce more tears, and people will say, I just tear a lot. Now, the answer to that by most allergists, and I tried, this is a clinical pearl, is to give them an antihistamine because they think they have allergic conjunctivitis. Well, if they have tear film dysfunction, you're actually going to dry their eye even more, meaning there's a defect, and you're causing more of a defect by drying the fluid because they can't lubricate as well. So again, this is the spectrum from SAC all the way down to AKC, VKC, and vasomotor uh, tear film. To, uh, and as you get to GPC, giant papillary or contact or blepharoconjunctivitis, those are non-IgE or non-allergic components. But it doesn't mean that they can't have an allergic component, but it means those conditions specifically don't have IgE-mediated processes. The contact is context, poison ivy of, of the eye. Next slide. So here's the Th1 versus Th2 paradigm. And it just literally starts with ocular allergy, meaning at allergy occurs younger in age. As you hit around age 40, you will start to mix in a dry eye film, whether it's due to menopausal, postmenopausal, or perimenopausal, or medication used by most elderly patients that they are starting to take some agents that will cause secondary drying of the eyes. These are sleeping pills, over-the-counter, uh, a variety of medications, the zipramine, uh, there's a lot of medications that will cause altered tear film abnormalities. So, and if you look at ocular allergy versus dry eye, again, it's just a different cytokine. It's an ocular allergy, it's histamine, it's an acute allergic response in dry eye, but there is an overlap in a publication that uh, a, uh, Hom and I uh, wrote in the annals. We, we reflected that, you know, red eye, tearing, can be seen in both of these conditions. And in fact, the overlap is quite high. And if you go, as per I, the prior slide, if it's around age 40, you know, you now m have a mixed condition. And again, another clinical pearl, and think about tear film dysfunction being part of it because when you, quote unquote, treat the nasal congestion and they're doing great on their nasal steroids, the ocular component will come out. Even though nasal steroids will have a positive impact on the ocular surface, in these patients, it is not, you know, it is not the primary treatment. But nonetheless, tear film dysfunction running an antihistamine, my biggest goal is to take them off antihistamines and see if I can get localized treatment because they do have a tear film abnormality that overlaps the ocular allergy. Next slide, which is slide number 11. Differential diagnosis, therefore, Okay, there is a cross reactive uh, susceptibility between dry eye and, and we talk about overlap. Irritation, burning in both, meaning when you have dry eye, they call it a burning, it's a burning sensation, grittiness. That's a, it, almost historical, you can get that feeling from the patient. In allergic conjunctivitis, the term is itch. It itches more. But on the other hand, you will get a, an overlap between those terms. You know you're dealing with a mixed type of conjunctivitis. You have oculars predominantly seasonal that are more intense and associated with rhinitis. Now, rhinitis is also associated with tear film. Why? Because if you excessively tear, you are going to have nasal lacrimal drainage, and you will have a runny nose, and it's clear. But it's really no sneezing, no other component with it. If you have a foreign body sensation, worsening in dry environments, a very classic one is that, you know, I go into the heat, my eyes get more symptoms. They get more of something in my eye suggests dry eye. If they're watching TV all the time or they're a banker, they're looking at a computer screen, their blinking rate decreases and they get more of a dry eye syndrome. Eosinophils uh, are associated definitively with ocular allergy. If there is an eosinophil in the conjunctival scraping, it is an allergic response that is playing a high role. High Ig le levels have been recorded, but it's very hard to measure and we don't have anything yet though there are some companies going to provide high measurement of Ig, but I've been trying to tell them to do the triptase because triptase is much more specific for mast cell activation and would be more, uh, can, would be more indicative of an alert, whereas IgE may be nonspecific. What's the difference between allergies and bacterial infection? Resolution. Bacterial conjunctivitis resolves. Allergy persists for, you know, one to three, four, five weeks. So, 
most of the allergy symptoms, are you all know, are quote unquote sensory. Ocular itch, pain, sensitivity, nasal congestion, oral pharyngeal burning, lungs, cough, dyspnea, GI tract, dysphagia, burning, it, and the skin, itch and burning. So you get a sense. From what we're going to talk, getting an overview, how do you classify? Every, everything nowadays is classifications. Uh, the Europeans and the U.S. haven't totally come to agreement yet. In, the, in Europe, they use intermittent, less than four weeks in duration. Here, we use the term seasonal allergic, meaning it's, you know, it takes on a, a certain period of time, two to three weeks, bingo, done. It affects over a third of the general population, and it may be approaching 40%. It's 80 to 90% of patients with allergic rhinitis has, have a seasonal component of their ocular involvement. Um, only 10% without allergic rhinitis, meaning do you have sole people with just ocular? Rare. It's less than 10%. In the persistent form, again, defining in the European literature, intermittent versus persistent, the cutoff is four weeks. Perennial is the U.S., still, we still call it perennial. And in a study by Dart in 86, and in a more recent study in, by Hopkins, I should have put it in here, um, it was, again, found that patients in inner city health care do have, quote, unquote, perennial symptoms that occur. And it, co it goes up to 10, 20 percent uh, in the more recent studies based, uh, like I say, out of Hopkins. It was a retrospective study of database. There is an increasing as asthma prevalence. Now, in another study that we published in the annals, um, and it showed those individuals who had allergic rhinitis and conjunctive what we call nasal ocular symptoms based upon the CDC database, those individuals who had in the years, you know, 10 between, you know, 5 to 10, uh, 10 to 20, those are the ones who had three to five-fold development of asthma, meaning if you have kids with severe, moderate, persistent um, forms of allergic conjunctivitis, rhinitis as a child, they have an increased frequency of having asthma as they evolve in age. Overall, the prevalence affects 25, maybe as high as 40% in a recent survey, meaning self-reported survey, but it's probably closer to 30 to over 30. It accounts for this con combined condition over 90%, grade 80 to 90% of allergic disorders, and clearly, solidly, more than 80% suffer from allergic conjunctivitis when they report nasal symptoms. And uh, it's almost a one-to-one -one ratio if you looked at cloths uh, in a study of self-reporting in uh, allergies across America studies. Ocular symptoms severely affect, again, the seasonal component. And 90% uh, of right now take an oral nasal treatment. And I, we just talked about what that treatment of antihistamine would be. So if you look at differential diagnosis, we have infectious which is on slide 15, infectious, allergic, or nonspecific irritation. Why do I add this? The reason for that is that the eye is sensitive to parts per billion, and the nose is sensitive to parts per million in irritants. What, what, and what clinical relevance should that have? Well, if you walk into a building and you have patients who are working in a new office building, degassing, it's called the sick building syndrome. Their eye symptoms will be, their, will be more sensitive to the formaldehyde or volatile organic chemicals than, quote, unquote, their nose. The eye <clears throat> it basically is a windshield wiper effect. Things are impacting on it, and it gets cleaned off every, uh, uh, well, we'll talk about medications uh, later. The allergic response, you know, uh, in, in that regards, you know, in the nose, for example, that's a vacuum cleaner. It's you're inhaling. It's a vortex of pollen and materials going into it. So even though it's part per million, you know that you would take, it, but you get more. You get more million. You more get more particles into the nose. So you do get an effect. But the eye is extremely, extremely sensitive um, to volatile organic chemicals, and will be. You know, people will have dry eyes when they go on airplanes. There, there, there have been studies of uh, stewards and. You know, and stewardesses uh, on ocular, people who work on airplanes and the air quality. Redness, let's go over this more important. It is the most frequently count, you know, complaint, my eyes are red, 
and it's obviously hyperemia of the conjunctival vessels. How do you differentiate conjunctival vessels versus scleral, meaning the white of the eye versus conjunctiva? There are two easy methods to do so. One is using something like a decongestant like Visine. I have no property or I don't own any shares in it. It's an oxymetazoline, any decongestant. A decongestant will decrease the injection of conjunctiva, but not of scleral or ciliary vessels. They are not responsive. They're too deep. Uh, they will not respond to topical application. Two, you can wash your hands, and conjunctival vessels move when you touch them. Episcleral vessels do not. Conjunctival vessels, three, my, this is a low, low tier, not associated with pain. Remember, conjunctivitis not rarely, is rarely associated with pain unless it involves a cornea, inside the eye, something is involved. Whereas episcleral may be painless, but can be painful as well. You look for erythema of the eyelids, subconjunctival hemorrhage is a really scary one, but it's one of the most benign. And we talked about the differential diagnosis in prior. If you look at slide number 17, which is the scariest slide, is a conjunctival hemorrhage, which everybody goes running to the doctor, but it is clearly a, you know, a blown blood vessel that spreads throughout the conjunctiva. Now, the junction between the blood and the cornea, you can see a it's a line. Now, normally the, this conjunctiva is clear, and that line could be purely red as if it's here, and that would be considered a ciliary flush. That means there's some inflammation occurring beneath it. And I'm just using this picture on slide 17 to give you where are you going to look for this ciliary flush, uh, the rim of fire. Uh, as people will say, the Pacific Rim with volcanoes. The Pacific Rim of volcanoes is around the cornea, at the junction with the conjunctiva, <clears throat> that's where the ciliary body underneath of it, it, it deposits immune complexes. So why do I use the word immune complexes? Immune complexes cause inflammation classically when they deposit at a site from high pressure to low pressure where there's an eluent, such as kidney. <coughs> the glomeruli produces urine. High pressure arterial to... A, the glomeruli, glomeruli, and once the urine, the, uh, the, the urine is excreted, the immune complex deposits and causes glomerulonephritis. The same occurs in the ciliary body where there's an eluent. The same occurs in the brain where there's CSF produced. This, but what another place of immune complexes, which is very unusual, but we see it and it's understood, in vasculitis at turbulent sites on arterial branches. So immune complex disease is an area where I trained at the NIH where I was involved. Slide number 18, pain, we talked about that. Pain, pain, pain is not allergy. Think something else. Sudden increase in intraocular pressure, trauma, something else. Foreign body sensation, again, other causes. Uh, you can even get rubbing of eyelashes against the cord, where it rubs inside, which we call trachiasis. Photophobia, again, inside the eye, not normally seen. It's uh, seen in something, uveitis, iritis. Can also occur in corneal, because the corneal nerves are, are exposed. Itching, we talked about. Classically, burning, we also, as, as an overlap or associated with tear film, but it can occur together. Scratching and burning, as we said, are dryness issues. Um, and therefore, you have to think about other drugs. If you have keratoconjunctivitis sicca, that's true from Shargas, sh but you can get excessive tearing in tear film dysfunction. I'm trying to, that's where the word watering comes in. It's an inadequate tear drainage or reflexively, as we just discussed. Next slide. Here we have the classic eye. Uh, again, so we talked about where would we see the rim of fire, where the white meets the, the quote-unquote, the iris, okay, um, where I show the conjunctiva. That is where you would see, if you saw a selected ring of red in there, maybe 10 degrees, 20, 30 degrees, you know you have inflammation inside the eye. You talk to them and say, are you having some problem with photophobia? 
some pain on, on light exposure, uh, discomfort that's a little bit beyond the measure. And you look at the pupil. It's, it's, it's going to be open, wide open, or is it going to be myotic, shrunken? What's the answer to that? Hello? Uveitis. Uveitis. What's, what's, what happens to the pupil? It shrinks. Small and Shrink. not very responsive. It shrinks, or it actually will shrink, or it's not responsive because it's so shr it's already sh it shrinks, and it's not responsive anymore because it can't shrink anymore. But it's smaller than the opposite side if you have unilateral uveitis. Okay, um, let's go to the next slide. SAC, PAC. We kind of remember, we talked about persistent, intermittent. Um, it doesn't have it. it rarely involves per sleep, but, but people do have rhinitis problems and it will lead sleep dis disturbance. So next slide, acute allergic. Okay, <clears throat> this is obviously, what do you see here? On the lateral side, uh, this is slide number 21. You're all on that slide? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, so on the quote unquote, on the, uh, the right side of the slide is the canthus port toward the nose, the left is the temporal side. You can see on the temporal side there's a little stringy item from the eyelid to the eyeball. That's a protein material, the stringy protein, ropey discharge, very limited, but it's there. That's all made out of protein. As you move to the eyeball, you can see the light reflecting where the what I call the rim of fire normally is on the upper portion of the eyeball. You see that? Light is being reflected off of the conjunctiva. At the rim? Yeah. Does everybody see that? Yes. Yeah. Well, that is called chemosis, C-H-E-M-O-S-I-S. -S. It's equivalent to an urticaria of the eye. It's where the clear conjunctiva is swelling. And it raises itself up when it should be smooth in the same plane as the cornea. And that's why you can actually see the light reflect of that and then there's a valley, and then you see the cornea light reflecting off it. The cornea itself is not involved. Cornea is, now here's another clinical pearl, just a thought. Cornea is the most easily transplantable tissue in the human body. And the reason, and you don't need the HLA typing to transfer one cornea from one person in this room to another. And that's because it's a vascular. So a sign of rejection of corneal transplant is vascularity. Just something to notice. You see uh, a vascular eye. Is there something going on? It, it, there's encroachment because it's supposed to be avascular. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Next slide. Here we have some horrific looking eyes. Um, obviously on top is extreme chromosis. Again, but the cornea is recessed in and you see the eyeball is really, you know, conjunctiva is really swollen. And the, the redness diffuse. It's light, lighter pink toward the cornea. It gets more diffuse as we, or I should say, becomes more red. Um, so it, it actually dissipates as you go uh, closer to the cornea, but it becomes pinker as you go peripherally. In the picture below, what can you tell me about this person? You see, you can definitely see the light reflecting off the bulbar conjunctiva. So there's chemosis, right? Everybody see that on the, right eye, on the patient's right eye? What else do you see? Take a look at the eyebrows. They're kind of only they're about half. What happened to the other half? That's when you get some rubbing your eyebrow for excessive eye rubbing. You actually, some people rub their eyeball, you know, the eyebrows off. And that is, you know, the, it removes it. So it's, a dehort, it's called the Horta Hayes sign. I don't think you guys are going to need that for the boards, but it's a sign. What other sign do you see here? Allergic shiners. Bingo. Very good. Allergic shiners. And that's what everybody looks at, but they, don't, they forget to look at the eye, eyebrows. And obviously they see the chemosis. So I, I just want you to, when you see an exam, because when you do your documentation, this is, you know, what you are going to practice, you're going to be audited. The more you have positive signs that you did something, the less they they hit you back saying, oh, wow, you saw something. Otherwise, it's always normal. I mean, I, I hate to say it. Uh, I go to the hospital and I, I, I do consults, 
and <clears throat> nasal, you know, in here, ears, nose, and throat normal. I says, did anybody look? You know, uh, <laughs> and I asked the patient. They said, no, okay. Um, <clears throat> and I always use this as a clinical pearl for when they do physical exams. Why do people during anaphylaxis feel like their throat is closing? Anybody have a good idea? Have an idea? You get your lecture on anaphylaxis? We have. <laughs> but why does it feel like your throat's closing? What's that? Well, let me just say that what is the most, the periocular tissue is a very common tissue, number one, for seeing angioedema or anasarca, right? If you're in the intensive care, your person's hypertropanemic and they're, they're horizontal, meaning they're lying in bed, they, they will have swell, swelling of their eyelids in the periocular tissue. That's anasarca, you know, where their the oncotic pressure <coughs> is low and fluid comes out. Also in angioedema, you know, you actually allergic response, you have a lot of spongiotic tissue that around the eye occurs. Now, what's that got to do with the throat? Look at the uvula. The uvula becomes a golf ball during allergic responses or anaphylaxis. And if you have a golf ball in the back of your throat, you're going to feel like, what? Can't swallow, can't breathe, my throat's closing. That's, so one of the clinical pearls I t when I train is that when you, before you start your desensitization in penicillin, look at the uvula. It's, it, and if it reacts, you can't make that up. Or a person says, I think I'm, I'm starting to react. So the two things I always look at is their oxygenation, their uvula, and listen to their lungs. And many of them are just mentally afraid. I mean, it, and I continue with the desensitization, and they do fine. But again, if the uvula swells, you can't make that up. Or your oxygenation drops, you can't make that up. You can make up wheezing if you really know how to do that. Okay, let's continue. Next slide. Allergy is bilateral. We talked about ocular itch, redness, the puffiness, and edema, lid edema, chemosis we gave over, burning, stinging. We talked about what burning really does. Stinging is dry eye. Tearing is excessive. could be from allergies itself or tear film abnormality where you have an abnormality in either the meibomian gland producing oil or the mucinous glands uh, producing the protein mucin. Rarely is associated with photophobia, but I put it there because I wanted to highlight that statement. It's not common. Next slide. Atopic keratoconjunctitis, which you need to see. You actually see, if you see 20 patients with atopic dermatitis, you have, probably have one or two patients with um, atopic keratoconjunctivitis. It is usually bilateral, more severe, and it's much more severe than the SAC seasonal or perennial. They definitely have burning as well as itching and excessive tearing. They just, they're, and they do have tear film abnormalities as well as allergies. It's just an overall, overall problem. And they have a gritty sensation, many of them, with photophobia because the term is atopic keratoconjunctivitis. Uh, it involves the cornea uh, in the more chronic forms. It's perennial. It has a stringy mucoid discharge and a droopy lower eyelids more commonly seen in elderly over time. Can it occur in children? Yes. Whereas vernal is predominantly in children. We're going to talk about vernal. It's predominantly in children and burns out by the time they're adolescent. So if there is a difference in just in age and looking in that. The signs are indurated, macerate eyelids. It's, I'll show you a picture in a minute. Uh, secondary blepharitis and meibomianitis, which in the glands themselves. If you really get, if I was, if you're rotating with me, or if I could, if we give you uh, ocular allergy uh, pearls and finds, so, you know, this is, uh, you know, uh, 101. So we would go to 201. We go a different level. We go over, you know, pressure readings and uh, looking at meibomian glands. How you can tell that there's uh, just by examining the eyelid. It's almost like you're looking at capillary uh, capillaroscopy, which I used to do, or I still do, uh, for patients with autoimmune diseases. But you can see meibomian gland dropout, and that shows a decrease in glands. If you want to take a quick look, lower your eyelid or lo lower your patient's eyelid and look at the rim, and you will see like almost little uh, rivulets. Those are little rivulets. There are literally oil-producing um, glands that run to the eyelid uh, edge. 
and they drop out as dry eye forms with age, especially. And it's the same thing if you look at if you ever look at cap. Have you, anybody do nail fold capillaroscopy there? Anybody? No. Well, in an autom if you ever see an, a Sjogren's patient, take your ophthalmoscope, which is nothing more than a, a magnifying glass, 14x. Put a little water over the nail bed, and look at it, and you will see an. In normals, you will see normal loops of capillaries. In Sjogren's, you will see one. They will see dropout, and every fifth or every site of fifth or sixth or seventh, there is a looks like a glomerulite. It's it, it's a blown up blood vessel. That is consistent and for a diagnostic purpose of an autoimmune disease. Next slide. Too many pearls. <laughs> too little time. Too little time. Next slide is now we have the, the, the bilateral AKC patient, macerated, lower lids involvement, redness of the eyelids, redness of the eyeball, and may have um, involvement of the cornea as well. Next slide, which is a single eye being shown on slide 26. That is, look at the skin around the eyelid. It's macerated. This is not a two-year-old. This is a 62-year-old who's had chronic atopic keratoconjunctivitis, and look at the upper eyelid. Is it touching the pupil? Yes or no? Yes. That's ptosis. Your eye, if you look at the next 10 patients, look at the normal eyelid and the position it normally holds of, regarding to the pupil. It's about two, three millimeters above it. If the eyelid touches the pupil or seen to be almost touching the pupil, it seems to be totic. Ptosis appears to be present. Okay. Also, what you also notice here on the lower eyelid, there are no eyelashes. He's been rubbing. He's, they're rubbed out. They've been suffocated. They're gone. Problem. Next slide. This is a slide 27. Keratoconus. We talked about that. A coning of the anterior surface. Of, and that's just looking at it. If you look at the next 10, you'll see normal curvature. It's, you know, if you look at the slide on, on this slide on the left, it's about you know, three, four millimeters bulging out in the middle, uh, four millimeters. Um, but that's quote unquote. Now, what you don't see here, and you can see, if there was glaucoma, the inside, the iris would be bulging forward. Right now, you see it flat. You can, you can appreciate the flatness of the, of the pupil and the, on, the, on the iris, I mean. You can appreciate it here. You can, but if it was bulging, the quote unquote, the iris would have a little, would be flaring out. In the middle picture, corneal ulcers, classic. Now the reason ulcers occur in patients with AKC is because of something from eosinophils called major basic protein. And if you remember from asthma, major basic protein is deposited in the epithelial cell layer of the bronchus you will get ciliary bodies. It, it literally, you will get the uh, literally ciliary sloughing. <clears throat> excuse me, epithelial sloughing of. And you, if you look at their sputum, which you guys don't do anymore, but um, you would see living cells beating. And major base of protein causes is an anti-glue. It deglues epithelial cells. Um, so again, these are. You know, the famous Criola bodies that you remember for Robin's textbook pathology. Now, take a look at the upper lid, or upper portion of this slide, of this middle picture. You see blood vessels encroaching upon the cornea. Correct? You see it? And why is that? Because there are blood vessels. These are where the eosinophils are, are, are causing inflammatory response. So there is a growth factor for blood vessels to go there. Not that they had a corneal transplant rejecting, they're having an involvement of attraction of growth vessels. In the third, in the third picture on the right, those are transistots or horner. Those are eosinophilic deposits that are evanescent. They're there for 6, 12, 24 hours. So if you see them, take a picture and send them to an ophthalmologist. They'll be duly impressed that you noted because those are, the, uh, are classically so seen in what we call limbal involvement. It's at the limbus of the, quote, unquote, the um, bulbar conjunctiva 
versus the junction with the cornea. Next slide. We're going to finish this off quickly since I, we have 10 minutes left, correct? Yes. Vernal. Vernal is seen in kids. And you see the ver word vernal is that it's spring. It's a uh, frequent onset in spring, but yet 50% of the time their skin tests are negative. So immunotherapy is not an indication here, but they have intense pruritus. So it's like, I have good news and bad news. They're going to be miserable till they hit their, quote, unquote, change of life at age 12 or 13. And some of this starts at between ages 3, 4, and 5. So you have five, six, seven years of misery. They're nonspecific triggers from wind, dust, or bright light, intense pruritus, foreign body sensation, and excessive mucus discharge, which could be stringy, and photophobia because it involves keratol, the cornea. And like I said, the cornea is usually due. Where is the droopiness, though? In AKC, it's normally in the elderly in the lower eyelid. In the quote-unquote invernal, ptosis more commonly involvement of the upper eyelid would do the infiltration of cell involvement. So you get cobblestoning on the upper tarsa. We get a white linear scar sometimes seen, but I, 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 you don't need to know more so the, uh, well, that will be in lesson 201 showing you that. Maybe it may have a shield ulcer, just like I showed you the ulcers of the cornea before. Transus dots, as I showed you on the libel sites, those are classic, or Horner's fault. There are epithelial cells and eos at, at the superior limbus, which are more common. Next slide. It's a site-threatening disease. I see, you don't see them much in the United States. Um, we see more of them in the Mediterranean basin, so therefore children coming from uh, Mediterranean, Asian, African, Middle East, Sahara, um, association with atopic disease, 37%, uh, 35% by history, 51%, half of them were skin test positive. There is a study out of Israel that 50% uh, of them, or a lot of them, uh, greater than 50%, 70 to 80%, had a positive test, um, patch test, actually delayed hypersensitive to uh, dust mite. And as I said, the issue is that the onset is before 10 years of age, resolves four to 10 years after puberty. It's um, good news, bad news. You're, you have it, and it's going to take time, but you're going to lose it, thank God. Otherwise, it's, it's horrible. This is the cobblestoning you see on the upper eyelid on the, left, on the slide number um, on slide 30. And you can see, again, the trances dots, little little vesicle bl blister pack, uh, gelatinous limbal infiltrates on the right. Well, that's a limbal tar type of BKC versus tarsal type. You'll hear that term. Again, here, next slide on 31, tarsal type involving the upper eyelid and the horner dots on the right, limbal type. Next slide, slide 32. It's bilateral. Look at the gelatinous. You can see the light reflection of these papillaries uh, on the upper eyelids. Next slide, slide number 33. Symptoms, again, for GPC, normally seen with uh, itching, blurred. Again, it looks pretty much like everything else except one thing. It's probably not allergic. Um, but it's, it can be associated with people with allergies can have it. More commonly seen with, quote, unquote, contact lenses or old contact lens intolerance or a suture in the eye that, you know, from an eye that will, will cause this. So that's where the term giant papillary come from. Eyelid dermatitis, just in general, this is slide 35. Personal care products, you know, uh, the nail polish of an artificial nail is where they touch their eye and their nail lacquer comes off um, or mascara, but quite common. Atopic dermatitis comprises almost 20%. Seborrheic is in the differential, as well as rosacea uh, and periorb. And, well, we're not going to get into the treatments of those conditions. We are coming out with an icon. Uh, hopefully it will be so many, oh, my God, in August this week. I, I can't keep up with the stuff I've got to do. Uh, it's the international uh, consensus of um, ocular allergy. It's an international group that I've been working on for 10 years. It's basically what you've gotten over here. This is a differential diagnosis slide of, you know, acute, seasonal, chronic. We talked about AKC, VKC. If it's infection, viral, bacterial, gummy, blue eyes, uh, autoimmune, uveitis, pain, extraocular, pain, pain, pain. You can get involvement with vasculitis, episcleritis, scleritis. We talked about those. 
Stevens Johnson, we didn't, but uh, immunity deficiency, obviously, ataxia T laryngectasia, the T laryngectasia is seen on the eye, and there are uh, AIDS are notoriously associated with HIV infections with dry eye syndrome. Nonspecific, the last comment. <clears throat> I missed a case, I'll, I'll be quite honest, of excessive chemosis, not responsive, and it didn't respond over um, six weeks, and now I learned my lesson. Think thyroid. Graves' disease will give you chronic chemosis that just doesn't respond, but she was skin test positive, so I expected to be allergic. It wasn't, and I diagnosed Graves' disease, but it was later, <laughs> later than it should have been uh, in that regards. Medication in the last five minutes, oh boy. I never, get in, I never have enough time. Let's go to slide 40. Uh, prescription versus OTC. Everybody, has, there's a lot of OTC meds out there, uh, and so it's a one to ten. It's, it's a one to ten per, uh, use, meaning for every bottle that you prescribe, there you have ten other bottles, and I, and they can get something called conjunctivitis medicamentosa, and you really need to know what medications to use. Chronic use of vasoconstrictors is a problem. Acute versus chronic. This slide 41. Anything you put in the eye, refrigerate. Cool compresses work extremely well just for release. So if, you, if they work well, if you refrigerate the medication, they will work well. There are studies of contact lenses, disposable improvement, lubrication also. Next slide, 42. So what are we going to treat? Secondary. Well, the antihistamines treat the itch. The decongestants treat the erythema. The de but mast cell stabilizing agents were never really approved for seasonal allergic, but were actually excellent for, or excellent, they improved healing of corneal ulcers. The medications we have today are the multiple action items, uh, agents, and we'll talk a little bit about that in the last few minutes. And this reference 2002, stay tuned, it will be 2000, it'll be 20,000, so that, that number two in the last digit will be switched to the uh, the decade will be 2020, hopefully, that you'll have the new uh, treatment algorithm of, of, of all this, which actually contains this updated. Mast cell stabilizers on slide number 43. Again, cornea. Um, again, there are, many of these drugs are no longer available. Now, Docum or not, not available here, but available in other countries. Topical antihistamines get rid of the itch. Adding an H2. Uh, some of them have H2 effect, does decrease, you know, decongestion was a study done by Mark Abelson, even though he forgets his own studies, but it has that positive effect in that regards. Um, where am I? We're here. Next slide, 46. 46. 46 steroids. There are steroids you could use, and that steroid is lodopredinol. In the low, low concentration, it's called Alrex. It's specifically indicated for allergic conjunctivitis, but many health plans don't ap approve it. So use Lodopredinol 0.5%, Lodomax. It's higher concentration. It has a poor absorption into the eye itself. Um, and as such, it will, quote, quote unquote, will, it will not have much of a change in pressure. And I use it, for, especially like you use steroid bursts for asthma, I use this for severe eye disease. You feel comfortable. For tear film dysfunction, I recommend typo, typo, uh, topical cyclosporin. And let's see if I have, we're going to do quickly some cases. I have two minutes left? Yep. Okay, 26-year-old mildly asthmatic, been treating for immunotherapy several years, comes, you know, follow-up. Uh, to the social birch pollen ragweed dust mite develops progressive irritation in her right eye. Right eye, unilateral. So you've got to think about that. It's unilateral, 26-year-old. Does not complain of any change or asthma. Does not complain of any nausea. Her eye initially had ropey discharge and from the one eye. Now she's noticed eyelids appear more sticky in the morning. Gummy, gluey, right? She comes in for a routine visit. Examiner says, you see opaque yellowish mucus strand is noted on the eyelid with moderate injection of conjunctiva. The other I had only mild injection. And the answer is, what do you treat with this with? D. Lubrication you, it would be the right one. But now, the most common topical antibiotic that gets most primary care doctors in, in, into trouble is Tobradex. 
It's a great drug, has sobermycin, but it has dexamethasone. So if it's viral, it's going to promote it. And it also is highly absorbing and increases intraocular pressure. So clean it first. And, then, and if you're going to use an antibiotic, don't use it with a steroid because of potential viral, and you may have mi missed a viral infection. Slide 48. Uh, slide 49, that's this is the, uh, so that, this highlights of what's going on. Slide 49. Okay, let's get the last ones here. Uh, 26, again, we, we talked about lubricant, the topical st combined antibiotic steroid agent, what, how to use that and when to use it. We talked about that. And now we're on the slide 50. 48-year-old referred to you by an internist value in allergic conjunctivitis, both bilateral, no medical history, eczema, food allergy, child, does not have any asthma, does notice early winter months for the past several years, notice increase in ocular symptoms, grittiness, itching, increased blinking while working on the computer. Remember that? Computer workers have a decreasing what we call tear film uh, or poor blinking rate. Which of the following, you know, further value, we've had normal response to histamine saline, basically not allergic. What do you do? What do you have? Answer is? D. 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 Good. Tear film dysfunction. Very important. Here's the highlighted points. Winter months when it's dry, itching and grittiness, blinking while working a computer. But, but actually, a paradigm, you know, you, you thought it was going to be allergic, but it's not. So we have tear film dysfunction. And the final case. I think this is the final case. Yes, final case. 12-year-old boy referred to you, chronic persistent red eyes. You're now in, uh, you guys are in Kansas City, but he just moved there, and he moved there from uh, Morocco. Uh, the mother describes the child as having symptoms at a time turning in Morocco started approximately three years ago. Again, that almost gives it away right down to there. He has a runny nose, watery eyes, mild, injected with white, ropey filament, lower fornices. We know where the fornices are now. We do see some boggy nasal mucosa. Antihistamines have been used only intermittently, not worked very well. Further evaluation that he has normal histamine saline with no, again, negative. Negative, negative, negative. And the answer to this is? VKC. <coughs> Done. I'm sorry I'm a little bit overly sorry we started late, but I, just to give you a flavor of where some caveats are. Any questions? I don't think so. No. So I, I always normally show you a slide here, and I said for every one nose, there are two eyes. So it's a double the trouble. Just add it to your, you know, just add it to your uh, physical, and you, it, it, it works. And people appreciate it, because especially after treating their nasal symptoms, their ocular symptoms become more pronounced. Okay. Thank you very much for your talk Paul? this morning. Um, okay. Um, and have a good week. Okay. So, thank you. You too. All right. Bye.